Hey everyone, it's Alex Ball with another episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast. I'm excited to bring you all a conversation with Jordan Schiebel of Middleway Farm. Jordan and his crew are growing mixed veg for local wholesale, retail, and direct-to-consumer through a home delivery CSA and online farmer's market out there in Windy, Iowa. We dig deep into selling to local specialty grocers, no-till tunnel production, the importance of consistent labor, and the growth they capitalized on during the pandemic. Jordan is building a community and convenience-centric model that's hard enough to learn something from. So without further ado, Jordan of Middleway Farm. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crops, spreading compost, mowing under fences, clearing snow, and much more, all powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. We have been using a BCS tractor on our farm since 2014, and it has saved the day and leveled the workload more times than I can count. And I find new ways to employ it every single season. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. And while you're there, select tractors and attachments on sale through the end of this year. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right. Enjoy the show. So I'm so excited to be here with Jordan from Middleway Farm out in Iowa. Jordan, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and chat with me. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you and to talk about my farm. Yeah. So uh, where are you located? What zone are you in? And kind of how much land are you working on? Yeah, so I'm in uh, Grinnell, which is central Iowa. It's about a halfway between Des Moines and Iowa City, uh, right on I-80, which cuts through the middle of the state. Uh, we are in Zone Five A, and um, yeah, so we're like kind of right in the middle, right in the middle of the state. Okay, and I, I may have I may have looked on uh, on your on your website, but when's your main season? Uh, are you winter farming as well, or kind of how long are you producing for? Yeah, we've been, uh, our main, I, I say that our main season for selling is May through December. We do sometimes push sales a little bit past that, like into January and February. We're starting to do some season extension. Um, I built a high tunnel in 2018. Uh, we haven't really been able to push through the whole winter. Um, I know that there's growers who are in climates as cold as us who do, but for me, I've, I've struggled to kind of push through that the really deep winter time. Uh, like in February. And then also we grow a limited number of storage crops. So we don't quite grow, grow enough to like go through the whole season. So yeah, our main season, like our actual growing season is um, we usually plant outside in late March is when we can start getting out. And then we start to get frost in October. And then usually around mid-November is when we start to get really hard freezes. And that kind of ends the outdoor growing season. And, and you had you know, talked talking earlier, it's, pr- it's pretty windy there, isn't it? Where you're at? It's very windy. And yeah, it's, it's less, and as you go West, it gets even windier, but yeah, where we're at and I'm fairly exposed. I'm, uh, my land is up on a, uh, kind of a ridge top. And so we are just kind of don't have any trees around us, except for the, the kind of the farmstead, which is sort of on the, um, the, uh, East side of the field that I, uh, that I farm on. So I kind of have some protection from the East, but I'm exposed on all the other sides. Um, so yeah, I mean, especially in the spring and the fall, uh, and over the winter, we get a lot of wind. Summer tends to be better. We don't get as much wind in the summer, but um, it can be really challenging with things like row cover and tarps and things that want to fly away. So we've had to we've had to learn the hard way about how to actually put enough weights down on stuff to keep it in place. Um, and it's why I've been really hesitant about uh, doing like caterpillar tunnels or low tunnels, and why I've kind of been committed to just doing high tunnels, even though I've only done one. I think as we go forward. Uh, we're just, we're only going to build high tunnels because that's, I've, I've watched the high tunnel go through some really significant 
wind events. And so I kind of feel like that's the only safe way for us to do season extension, considering the um, the wind that we have. Although I've also seen lots of high tunnels get destroyed by wind. So I know that that's by no means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's like the benefit of, you know, you get the drainage, the drainage you get up, you can have a hill, but also that wind can, can be nasty. It can really get you. Yes. And I planted a, we planted a hedgerow around the, the garden, um, the, you know, sort of a two and a half acre field that I farm on and, and that's still not mature, but I'm hoping over, I'm starting to see a little bit of, um, of effect from that. Like I can see on the edge of the field that the crops are actually a little bit healthier that are closer up to the hedgerow. So I'm hoping over time that as the hedgerow gets bigger, we'll get a little bit more of a, of a protected area in our field. Yeah. It, how long do you, how long does it take till it gets that, you know, full fet of the hedgerow? Is it five, 10 years you're thinking, or is it like a 20 year kind of thing? Yeah, we'll see. So, I mean, I planted in 2017, so about five years in, so I'm starting to, and, and I, I've had to do a bunch of replanting too. So I've got very various maturity, but the section that is the best, that's about five years old, you know, that's, that's all about above my head now. So probably by year 10, I would think it's going to be around 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, and that's when it will really start having an effect deeper into the field. Yeah. Cause I think it's about, it's the, every, every foot of tree height, it's like you get 10 feet of protection. So if you have a 10 foot tree, it will give you a hundred feet of protection on the downwind side. Cool. So have you been at this spot your entire farming career or have you been in other places as well with, with, with Midway Farm itself? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is the only spot that I farmed at. I, um, I worked for another farm called Grinnell Heritage Farm, uh, for three years right after I left college. So I went to college at Grinnell College, stayed here in town, uh, worked for this other farm for three years. And then I got connected with, uh, the landowners where I lease my land now, the Lucina family. And they, um, they basically gave me a, pretty benevolent arrangement for accessing the land. So yeah, so I've been um, farming here since uh, 2000, fall of 2012. And my first growing season was 2013. So yeah, I've, I've been lucky enough to just be on this one piece of land and also to have access to some buildings and some equipment as well. So I really didn't need to start from scratch um, like a lot of a lot of growers do. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, having that, having some infrastructure already set up can just streamline things so much uh, and just help you just jump into the, the game. It's already so much, it's so much of a, a marathon and agriculture, but people able to have a little bit of a, a jump there is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so uh, besides yourself, uh, how many people work on the farm with you? Yeah. So uh, right now we have, um, during the, during the growing season, we have uh, usually a part-time crew of like four to five people. So working anywhere from like 10 to 30 hours a week. Um, so I, I've, uh, still got a couple people on staff right now. Um, I've laid a couple people off for the season um, recently. Uh, so that so then I'm the main, you know, I'm the owner, sole owner, main main labor, do do most of the the planning and the decision making. Um, but then I have my part time crew, and then also my landlord's family. Um, so my landlord and his wife, they live uh, off the farm now, so they live in town. And then his son and daughter-in-law live on the farm and they are actually quite involved in my operation. Um, so Laurel um, has taken over a lot of the business um, administration stuff for the farm, like bookkeeping, um, emails, um, uh, things like that. And then Joe um, has helped a lot with sort of projects and repair and building. Um, and so they kind of work on a sort of contractor wage basis for the farm. Um, so yeah, so... Um, yeah, so it's like it's me, it's the three or four part-time people, and then Joe and Laura are also working part-time. Okay, and I think I may have asked you before, uh, how much land are you uh, are you cropping uh, yearly? Yeah, yeah. So in actual like uh, you know tilled land or, or or land that we actually grow on, um, it's about two and a half acres, two and a third acres, and then you know it's about four to five acres total if you if you add in the field roads, the hedgerows. Um, the high tunnel, the greenhouse, uh, a few perennial crops like asparagus and, and rhubarb. But yeah, the actual fields that we kind of grow on each year that are outside are about two and a third acres. Okay. Uh, so you were said earlier that you're kind of, you're looking off the freeway. Uh, what's the nearest town to y'all just for you know people's context? Are you like in a yeah. rural situation? Are you like outside of a town? How were you like geographically? Yeah. I mean, we are right on the edge of Grinnell. So we're like the second farm north of Grinnell. I actually live in town and I commute out to the farm, but it's like a mile and a half to two mile commute. Um, so Grinnell is about 10,000 people. It's a college town. Grinnell College is here. It's about 1,500 students. Um, so yeah, we're located right next to Grinnell. Most of my business is in Grinnell. 
Um, I also sell in Newton, which is about 20 to 25 minutes down the road and is about 15,000 people. Um, and then I also sell um, in Des Moines as well. And so Des Moines is about an hour away and that's about 500,000 people in that metro. Um, and then in the other direction, uh, an hour is Iowa City, which is about 50,000 people and then Cedar Rapids. So we actually are located right in between like the, the two main metro areas in Iowa or two of the main metro areas in Iowa. And the farm I used to work for, Grinnell Heritage, they took advantage of that by they actually sold into both of those metros. Whereas in Iowa, typically most farms either are like a Des Moines farm or an Iowa City Cedar Rapids farm. So those are the kind of two food sheds and like never the twain shall meet, except you know, Heritage was kind of the bridge between those. So I haven't grown at a scale um, where it's made sense to me to try to sell into the, both those um, those markets. But um but yeah, and the county I'm in is a rural county. It's 18,000 people. Grinnell is the biggest town in that county. And you were saying that there are, uh, there's, a, there's a second farm out of town. Are there a lot of other vegetable farms in the area selling into the, into the community? Not so much. There's a handful of other farms. Um, I would say mostly, mostly what I would describe as hobby farms, um, uh, kind of farmers market focused, uh, part-time, um, part-time farmers. Um, I'm, Grinnell Heritage Farm was by far the biggest vegetable farm in the county and one of the biggest in the state. It, when they stopped farming in 2020, they were at 20 acres and they were certified organic. Um, so at this point, I'm I'm probably the the only I'm certified naturally grown. I'm by sales volume, um, I'm probably the biggest vegetable farm in the area. Um, but most of the vegetable farms in Iowa are kind of clustered more around those metro areas. So if you go to Des Moines, there's a bunch of farms. If you go to Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, there's a bunch of farms. If you go to the Omaha area, Quad City area, Davenport. So yeah, I feel a little bit kind of out on my own here. I do have a few you know, peers in the area, but most of the people I consider my peers are farming probably an hour or more away from me. Gotcha. It sounds like you've, you've carved out a nice little niche of a, of a, of a sales base in, in town. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have. I mean, a lot of my customers are associated with the college. Um, and so it's a pretty unique situation um, in terms of I don't think you could just go to any any town of 10,000 in Iowa and sort of build a CSA like I have. But I think I've been able to build a customer base um, around my CSA. And I think, yeah, I've kind of especially with Renault Heritage Farm gone, I kind of feel like I'm the only game in town when it comes to, you know, chemical free produce, producing at volume, producing across a, a big season. Um, yeah, so I definitely have a, a good niche here. And I really like that I'm able to sell in Grinnell, like in the community where I live, rather than having to drive elsewhere to sell, even though I do sell into those markets, they're not my primary markets. But I know that if I want to expand that those are the markets that I'm going to have to go for, because in a way, I've kind of maxed out Grinnell. So yeah, yeah, I, I we kind of do the similar thing where I live in a small town, or not, it's, a, it's a college town, but then I commute to my farm. And I kind of feel like the fact that I'm in the community that I'm selling into, I have a little bit of a le like leg up on like demand, understand what consumers want, uh, just being closer to your consumer, I think is always uh, is always a, a advantage on some level. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think um, yeah, we probably have so somewhat similar. I mean, we're kind of similar ages. We kind of started farming when we were young. People kind of buy into our story, you know, being like, oh, like I'm helping a young farmer and get to know us and connect with us through the newsletter. Yeah. So I found I really like, like that. I think it's been effective like, business strategy, but it really was just kind of it was not really like that conscious is just kind of what I did. And I just kind of grew into that identity. So, yeah. Have you found a good balance with living off farm and and then working, you know, being separated from that, from the from the, from the chaos of agriculture twenty four seven. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there's there's pros and cons to both. I mean, I think uh, you know my my wife does not work on the farm and she never has. She's always had her own full time job. You know, sort of. We kind of both have intense careers, but different careers. Um, and so, um, yeah. So I've never lived on the farm. And I've always commuted. So it's kind of the only thing that I know. Um, and it's a short commute, so I appreciate that. But yeah, it does get tiresome going back and forth, especially to do like watering and chores. You know, if I, on weekdays, it's not that big of a deal, but especially on weekends or needing to go back and forth. I'm really lucky that, um, you know, Joe and Laurel, who live here on the farm, are involved in the farm operation and are willing to pick up some of that slack. So I'm able to, you know, text them or be like, hey, can you close up tonight? Or hey, can you turn the irrigation off? Or hey, the wind just came up, can you close the high tunnel? So that I, and I try not to lean on them too hard um, in that regard, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, it's nice to have a little bit of separation from the farm. I like living in town, you know, I can walk and bike in town and I don't feel isolated. Um, but yeah, I mean, there would be tons of advantages to actually living here. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically this is the kind of the setup that 
that uh that we have and i think it's kind of what i'm going to have for the foreseeable future and, and and it's interesting because i feel like a number of my farming peers either had setups like this or continue to have setups like this where they they don't live on their farms they don't own their farms and they we call our commuter farmers we're having to go back and forth to our farms and and i've had friends who've had much worse commuting situations that I've had where they're 20, 30 minutes away from the farm. And I think that would, that would get really tiresome really quickly. Yeah, no, it would. I had a friend of mine who was d- commuting from Detroit to Ann Arbor every Ooh. single week, which, which is almost like, a, like an hour you know, plus traffic, you know, t- you know, back and forth every day. And I was like, man, that's a lot of driving to go, you know, <laughs> water some salad mix. That's a ton of work. Yeah. That'll wear you down for sure. And it's like, if you forget something, it's like, well, I'm not going to go back. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You're, 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 you're gone for the day. Yeah. Uh, you'd said earlier that, you know, you do some CSA in town. So what's kind of the makeup of your marketing for your business? You know, I saw you do some a lot of online sales as well. well explain to us kind of how you're selling your product. Yeah, and it's it's definitely changed over the years. I mean, I started out as a CSA and farmers market farm pretty, pretty uh, you know, primarily. I started out with just 14 CSA members in two, 2013 and doing one weekly market in Grinnell. Um, and we kind of grew the CSA and we grew our, you know, our farmers market sales over time. Um, we started to work with um, some retail co-ops during that time. So the Iowa Food Co-op in Des Moines, uh, Grinnell Farm to Table in Grinnell. Uh, so those are like online farmers market type type co-ops. Um, we've also begun to do uh, more wholesale. So we sell to a local IGA grocery store in Grinnell, which is I found very easy to work with. They're not a high volume place, but they'll they'll take a lot of different things that I that I sell and we have a lot of overlap in our customer base. So it works out well. Um, I also sell to Grinnell College, um, which they increasingly are, are, are purchasing more local. Um, and I, they definitely identified me as one of their primary local vendors. I'm a Grinnell College alum. So I already have connections there. Um, and then I also, there's a, uh, an aggregator called Farm Table Delivery that's based in Western Iowa that basically runs a truck between different farms and collects produce. And then they primarily sell to restaurants, um, uh, and small institutions. And so I've, I've sold uh, quite a bit wholesale through them. Um, so yeah, our, our market mix right now is CSA, um, our online uh, store, online farm stand, which we started in 2020 in response to COVID when we stopped doing the in-person farmers market. And we actually found that it worked a lot better for us and that we made more money and it was less effort. So we've continued to do that and we've not gone back to farmers market. And then, and then the wholesale, which wholesale has become increasingly important for us in the last few years. And it's been an interesting, you know, journey because we are a pretty small farm and especially in our beginning years, we were really focused on, you know, producing, um, for a retail market. And so kind of adapting to the wholesale market has been interesting for me. I've been trying to find my niche within that market because we're definitely not a volume producing farm. Um, but we can kind of find that niche where we're growing or we're selling kind of smaller case sizes. We're kind of finding crops that other people aren't offering, selling smaller case sizes and having a little bit of a higher price. So for us, our price is kind of in between retail and maybe what the the um, the main market wholesale is. Um, so yeah, that's that's our that's our our sales mix right now. So for that uh, for that retail wholesale accounts um what type of products are you selling so it, it, it's a grocery store a small grocery store you said yeah what kind of what kind of what's, what's your product mix uh you're selling to them what kind of stuff yeah i mean the main thing that we focused on is greens um you know and i i moved to doing those in an actual clamshell plastic clamshell because it just marketed a lot better than bags so like a labeled clamshell so that was kind of that's been our main our mainstay like whenever i have greens i've got them at the grocery store but we've tried everything else you know, so basically, and, and they're, they're wonderful in that they're like, Hey, I've got some daikons. You want to try selling those? <laughs> sure. They don't sell, but they at least try them. But we found some other things. Carrots are another thing that have sold well. Um, um, this week I'm bringing in Brussels sprouts and it, especially that's kind of a seasonal thing where in the lead up to Thanksgiving, we can, we can actually sell more at the grocery store than maybe we could over the summer when especially, um, the college is out of session and their sales are a little bit down. So their business is a little bit more seasonal too. Um, but yeah, we've done yeah greens, carrots, um, potatoes, tomatoes have actually worked out really well for us, like especially clamshell type to, uh, cherry tomatoes, but also just you know boxes of loose slicers and heirlooms. Um, yeah, we've done other things. Um, we've tried other stuff, but the the main ones that have worked really well for us have been like carrots, 
um, tomatoes and greens, which probably is not doesn't come as too much of a surprise. And is that uh, like a direct sale to the store? Is that consignment? Uh, how does that work with them? Yeah, it's a direct sale for the store. Um, one thing we we did do, um, I did do uh, plant starts on consignment with them mm. um, because we do actually do. We have a fairly large plant sale um, at the start, which which is something else we've we've started in the last five years. It's just gotten bigger and bigger for us every year, um, and so. Yeah. And I, so I started offering them just kind of some flats of herbs to sell and, and I didn't want them to have to commit to buying like this whole flat of herbs, you know, and put all that money up front when I knew they probably were going to sell them. So we kind of did that based on consignment, but yeah, everything else they just buy directly. And they do, I mean, basically we do small volumes and, and they sell out. So I think there's very little, probably way less waste from what they buy from me versus um, what they're getting elsewhere. So yeah, so it might be a smidge higher price, but the amount of shrink yes, they're having, exactly. the amount of shrink is much lower. Totally, and this is why, yeah, um, and this is why it works with this grocery store because it's a small IGA grocery store. They're known as being the expensive grocery store. They're known as having the premium stuff. So it it works out. You know, I haven't tried to work with like a high V or a Fairway, which are the big um, regional grocery store tra- chains here. I know some growers who have, but um, yeah, that's just kind of a different story as far as volume and pricing and. Yeah. Super interesting. So you had mentioned earlier that you work with some of these uh, third party, like online like retailers. Uh, are they yeah. all coming to, are they all pick up at your farm or do you deliver to the, to the warehouse somewhere and then they distribute from, from there? Yeah. With farm table del- delivery, it's interesting. I have, I have an interesting kind of set of distribution connections to make that work. So there's another grower in uh, Southeast Iowa. Um, their business is called Organic Greens. And they're primarily a microgreen grower, but they also have some other crops, including sweet potatoes. And they run a truck on kind of a circular route where they go from Southeast Iowa, they go through Grinnell, they go to Des Moines and they come back through. And so they kind of connect those two food sheds that I mentioned, okay. you know, the Iowa City, Cedar Rapids and the Des Moines. And um, so they actually come through Grinnell, they deliver to the same grocery store that I do, they deliver to the college. I meet their truck, I put my stuff on their truck and then they take it to Des Moines for me. I like and that. they meet the farm table truck where they put it on that truck and then that goes where it's going to go. So it's, um, you know, sometimes we're doing it where we're shuffling boxes in between the trucks and I'm just like, we really should be doing this on pallets, you know, or <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's kind of inefficient, but it's, we, we've, we've been making it work. Um, uh, yeah. And that, that, um, that person who runs organic greens, um, they've really kind of found that they have this niche of being able to connect those food sheds. And, and that's just something I think in general, we need more of um, is having more kind of distribution hubs and shared transportation between farms. You know, that's farm table delivery, which is the, the business that I that I use in Western Iowa that they they started out. That was their goal. It's like we what do farmers need? Farmers need someone to truck stuff for them. They don't have time to truck things. So that was kind of their impetus for starting. They're actually run by a, a farm family in Western Iowa that has very they, they do organic row crops and organic beef. They have an on farm store. Uh, they have a restaurant, like a farm table restaurant. So this family kind of has this like constellations of businesses in this small town in Western Iowa. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like building up, building up those local food logistic networks are just so important and really just to eliminate not only uh, the waste of you know five trucks driving to the same town a yeah. third full, but just to save us a little bit of time so that we can spend most of our time, you know, adding value to our products. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, you know, um, we, I mean, I think like, you know, Chris Newman, Solanaco Farm has talked a lot about this and I've, you know, um, definitely been influenced by the things that he's talked about, but just like farmers trying to do everything um, and uh, trying to be the the entire value chain. Um, And it just doesn't work because you don't have the skill or the time to do that. And so how do we figure out how like we can focus on different areas, like focus on production, someone else can focus on marketing or distribution and figuring out how not to be the, you know, cause you know, probably like you've like me, like you've probably derived a lot of value out of like being that person and like learning a lot, like being kind of learning how to market, learning how to do all those things. But also like there comes a point in which your business gets to a certain size where like, it's, it's not as sustainable anymore. Or you're maybe a little bit of burnt out at doing it. So yeah, like f- trying finding those connections and finding ways to, um, yeah, to share those different parts of the value chain. So every farm isn't duplicating the same the same things. There's so much redundancy in, in what we're doing, you know, sometimes. Yeah, especially uh, even, you know, in distribution, even they're beginning like, like seedling production, uh, compost litter, all things like that. Like yeah. I find we have like 10 local farmers, all tiny greenhouses raising a two trays of tomatoes each. And right. it's like, well, who's need one person doing all this? <laughs> this makes no sense. Yeah. We need to, 
group this together. So speaking of kind of like grouping products together and logistics, I saw on your on your website that through your uh, online store, you're also selling other local products as well. H- how does that work? Who are you working with in your community? Yeah. And that's, I would say that um, that's kind of fluctuated in terms of importance for the farm. And it was a little bit more important um, a few years ago at the start of doing the store in like 2020. But um, yeah, we've worked with uh, some an egg, a couple of egg producers. Um, there's actually a bakery on site on the farm um, that uh, one of the people who runs the bakery also works for me. So they're very tied into <laughs> my business and they're also a friend of mine. So I've sold their baked goods, which are fantastic. Um, and then I have a, a guy who forages mushrooms, who I've sold his mushrooms through the online store. And that's also just, you know, someone who I knew through farmer's market and um, also personally love their mushrooms. And then, um, yeah, so eggs, bread, and mushrooms have been the main ones that we've we've done. We also buy in from other producers. So, yeah, so basically our model has been we just buy from other producers and resell. So, um, you know, usually that means we're just kind of buying at their price and then we're, we're doing a markup. Our markup tends to be, you know, not as steep as, let's say, like a grocery store markup. But we do markup so that we're, we're actually making money from them. Um, and then with the with the bakery, we've had a little bit of a different arrangement. It's been more of kind of a pass through arrangement, and then a bread more of a bread share for for me personally. Um, but yeah, I've I've been interested in like doing meat, for example. But it's just it gets so much more complicated with storage and transportation. Um, yeah. But I do think there's a lot of value for customers in kind of being a one stop shop um, for people. Um, I've seen kind of varying amounts of buy in. Most of my customers just want vegetables, and they're not so much interested in the extras, but um, it definitely does add value for for some customers to have that have that stuff available. Yeah, from my interviews the last few weeks, I'm just in, even in our, in our own little community and in our farm, seeing the shift from this mentality of I have to produce every single item on this tenth of an acre yeah. to okay, focusing on what I do really well and then aggregate from all these other local producers. Uh, you and I were talking earlier about how you said just west of you, there's a little more snow packed, you know. Different, different microclimate. I feel like we have a we really have a good opportunity to take advantage of those, those microclimates to you know to not grow everything and just grow what, grow what really works well in our uh, yeah in our little space. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think like soil types are huge too. Like where I'm at, I have very heavy clay soil, which is great for growing certain crops, but it's it's not great for cucurbits. Um, you know, it's it's not the best for yeah, it's just not the best for growing every crop. So if I can work with a producer who's got sandier soil. You know, it just makes a lot of sense for them, you know, so I've moved away from growing winter squash and I buy that in. Um, uh, and then so partly it's like if I can grow it or not, like whether my soil is good. And then it's also like sometimes it's just a question of scale, like, uh, you know, storage onions, for example, like I don't think make as much sense on my scale. Um, and so I'm, I'm willing to just buy those in from someone who's producing a much higher volume and is selling them at a lower wholesale price so that then I can resell them at a you know more decent wholesale or more decent retail price. So yeah, that's I mean, then that's part of kind of eliminating the redundancies or kind of figuring out the crops that you're good at. And we definitely we we went through a shift last year where we cut out a bunch of crops, um, and we almost overcorrected. Where I think we kind of we cut down a little bit too lean, and I think we might mm-hmm. add a few more crops in. But part of that was we were you know it was like we were trying not to grow everything so that we could actually like you know buy in from another producer that we thought did a better job or was a better producer, but also. You know, I think noticing with CSA that, you know, sometimes, especially with our boxes where um, our standard boxes where people are just getting the farmer's choice box, that there was always certain crops that we always seem to be oversupplied on and our customers weren't as wild about. And so I kind of thought, what well, can we just eliminate those crops altogether and see if we can just get by using the kind of more popular crops or maybe just throw those less popular ones in like here and there. Um, so that's kind of been my focus, uh, especially this year of kind of paring down the CSA and trying to really, you know, just like make it the like all-star vegetables as much as I can. Um, and I think I've been re- reasonably successful at that, but I think like maybe overcorrected a little bit where I need to, I need to add back in a little bit of the variety. Yeah. Uh, and your CSA, are you delivering that people's homes to a location that they come to the farm? How does that work? Yeah. So in 2020, we started home delivery in Grinnell only. So like I said, we're right on the edge of town. Um, it's a great situation. I mean, I can do 20 to 25 deliveries per hour. So, uh, it's because it's dense, you know, I'm delivering in the same neighborhoods. Um, I'm not driving all over the place. So it it actually, it's a great situation for, to do home delivery and not have it add a ton of time or cost. And so people love it. And I've continued to do it even after, you know, um, 2020, 2021. So yeah, a lot of our customers do home delivery, but we also have an on-farm pickup. 
um, which again is right on the edge of town. So very convenient. And then we have one drop site in Newton um, in that town. That's about 20, 25 minutes down the road. And we're exploring doing a drop site in Des Moines because we have a little bit of a customer base and demand in Des Moines. So we may expand into Des Moines next year, which would be the, we, we did briefly expand into Ames, which is a town near Des Moines for a few years, but uh, mostly we've been pretty focused on Grinnell. And that delivery, do you charge for that or is that included with the price of other CSA? It's included with the price. And it was kind of like, you know, it's kind of a, well, especially in 2020, it was like, you know, we need to do this for everyone's safety. And so we're just going to do it. And then uh, with our, so we not only deliver the CSA, we also will deliver for the online farm stand, which is the, you know, just the store that's open to everyone. And in that situation, I was like, okay, if you have to, if you order 15 bucks worth, then you get home delivery. And so it was kind of a way to go people to, to buy a little bit more. And that worked out pretty well. But then I started running in the situation where people would like, would buy just like $5 or something, and then they'd get the delivery charge. And then they'd, they'd be annoyed by that or frustrated, or they felt blindsided by it or something. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to get rid of this altogether. It's just free home delivery. And I figure that what I'm doing is I'm just getting more sales and the, the more sales is going to make up for, um, you know, the cost. One thing I did add in this year, which was a great, um, great idea from a customer. They were like, Hey, we really value home delivery. We'd like to add something in extra. And so I, I just added a tip feature to the store. And so typically every like sales cycle, I get 25 to $50 in tips. So I figured wow. that basically like, you know, covers my basic delivery costs right there. So that was a, that was, and that was a, just, you know, someone, a customer tip um, to do that, uh, to add a, to add a tipping feature. So yeah, I would encourage other people to do that, to allow your customers to tip you because most of them really appreciate what you're doing and they they might want to add in a little bit more. That's super interesting. And I like the fact that, you know, you're in a really nice high density area. You know, 25 delivers per hour, that's 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 a lot. That's a yeah. really high amount. I th- I think like, I don't know, I've reports that like, like Amazon's like, you know, 150 a day, to, is, is, stops a day is, is a big amount. So it's 25 an hour, that's pretty impressive. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't even, I had never even like looked at the logistics in- industry and what their benchmarks are, but that would be kind of, that would be kind of fascinating, yeah. Yeah, the top people are saying like you know, 150 to 200, but that's super high density. And I've seen some down 75 to 100 a day, you know, in an eight hour shift. In an eight hour shift, so, yeah. I mean, but that, I mean, yeah. that's like, again, like, you know, I'm, I'm in Grinnell, it's like there, everyone is just constant. I mean, often I'm delivering like eight to like eight people on like a two block stretch you know, in Grinnell. Uh, so it's just, yeah, it's kind of, and I'm not going outside of town at all. So it just, it works out. It's a pretty unique situation. Like when other people have other farmers and I have asked me about home delivery, I'm like, well, like the caveat is, you know, you're probably going to have to drive all over creation to deliver to your people. So probably, you probably don't want to do that. It is something you're adding a ton of value, not only with the delivery, but offering all these add-ons, it's just a lot of value to these consumers that I'm just guessing, uh, just helps increase retention rates. Uh, year after year, we definitely saw a jump in our our customer base really expanded when we did home delivery and online orders. Um, and and you know it was kind of a revelation to me because I'd always done CSA and farmers market, and you know I live in Grinnell, I know a lot of people here, and there was I was always like, you know why doesn't this person order from here? Why doesn't this? Per-? I was always like questioning why like what someone wasn't my customer, and then when we moved to home delivery and online orders, I suddenly suddenly these people or people that I'd wondered about or whatever, or whatever just became really good customers, and I realized it was just a matter of convenience. And it was because they didn't want to pay up front for a CSA. They didn't want to set box of vegetables and they didn't want to come to the farmer's market, which was a three hour window once a week for like 24 weeks a year. And so I realized I was kind of making my customers jump through hoops to buy from me. And like I needed, and by having home delivery and online sales, I was really lowering the barriers to people ordering from me. And so that's, like I said, it's been, it's been better than farmer's market in terms of sales and it, and it's also less time and less physical effort for me to, you know, put everything in the van, take everything out, take everything down, not knowing if I'm going to sell everything. Um, yeah. So it's been great. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden podcast is brought to you by Certified Naturally Grown. At the heart of sustainable ag is the belief that soil health and thriving ecosystems grow the very best food. Certified Naturally Grown is a grassroots certification program that recognizes direct market farmers using holistic methods and shows your customers that the products you bring to market are grown to the highest ecological standards. If you're looking for an affordable certification option that focuses on the thriving of local farms and foodways, you're going to want to check out CNG. Their peer-to-peer inspections create opportunities for farmers to connect, exchange knowledge, and build regional support between growers, certify your produce, flowers, livestock, apiary, aquaponics, or mushroom operation today. 
Find out more at cngfarming.org. That's cngfarming.org. Today's episode is also brought to you by Orisha. Orisha is a greenhouse automation company whose mission is to make agriculture more ecological and productive through advanced technology. Orisha automates all temperature, humidity, and irrigation management systems. Their products are designed to be instinctive, easy to install, and wireless, and their remote management application allows growers to save time. In addition, the integration of AI in their programs offers more precision and better control over the various factors influencing the environment inside your greenhouse. Last thing, Orisha wants to help market gardeners optimize their yields. Automating allows a better quality of life, can save several weeks of labor costs, and saves nearly 20% in energy costs. Listeners can use the promo code no till grower that's three words no till grower to get 15% off your order. Check them out at orisha.io that's o r i s h a . i o. All right, back to the show. And what are you using to manage and organize uh this home deliver or, or sorry the online ordering what, what program are you using for that? Yeah, um it's been in flux. I mean like so in 2020 we got you know kind of blindsided by the pandemic and that happening so we we just basically used our Wix website to like take online orders. We 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 always use Small Farm Central. That was the CSA software um, that we used pretty much from the start. Um, and so we use that. We've always used that to for people to be able to customize their CSA shares, which has been a big part of um, our CSA for a long time. Um, we've always done a standard box and a custom CSA box. So we continued to use that. Um, but then we we basically spun up our Wix site to like sell to the general public. Um, but it really wasn't made for like vegetable. It was like made for selling like vintage clothes. It just like wasn't a functional piece of software. Um, and so also at the same time, Small Farm Central kind of ended and transitioned into Harvey. And we didn't really want to do Harvey because we already did customization. So it wasn't really, didn't make sense for us. So we ended up going with Local Food Marketplace, which was a a, a software that I was familiar with from other food co-ops. And actually I briefly ran a food co-op in Grinnell and that's the the software that we use. So it's much more of a food hub software. And at the time that we made the switch, I was kind of thinking, yeah, we're kind of moving in this direction of being like an aggregator sort of food hub, or or at least that's kind of like, you know, we're starting to buy in from other producers. So potentially other producers could use the website to manage their own inventory, you know, to be able to log in and do things versus us doing all of it. But in reality, it's kind of, it has more features than we really need. And it's a little bit more complicated than we need. So we're actually, uh, Going to switch to grown by, um, which I, I actually would have I would have done grown by when we made the switch from Small Farm Central, but they were just getting off the ground and they weren't ready to take customers yet. So now they are off the ground, um, and I've talked to them, and I think it it has the functionality we need. So we're going to switch to grown by. It's cheaper. It's cooperatively owned. It's more what we want to. It's more the kind of software that we want to have. So we're going to use that to manage our CSA and our online sales starting next year. I want to hear more about Grown By. Uh, what's the what's the price per month? Is it a yearly? How, how does all the, how do the fees work for that? They do a percent of sales, um, and that is all inclusive of like the credit card fees. Um, and so, like with local food marketplace, we um, basically would we had to pay a setup fee, and then we pay a set amount every year, and then we also have to pay a percent on our credit card fees. Um, and so when you look at it all put together, the price for grown by is cheaper because everything is together in a single package. So I think it's from memory, it's four to five percent of sales, um, which includes your credit, which includes your credit card as well. So it's um it's it's better than what we're doing now. Um and the the software is a little bit simpler than local food marketplace because again, it's not a food hub software, it's more like a farm farm software. And the really interesting thing about grown by, and they're very much in development, you know, they're, they're like just a few years old and they're responding to requests from farmers. And the interesting thing is their website is like, you, you can go to grown by and you can see farms that are available on grown by. And so the idea is that you could like order from multiple farms off of the grown by site. Um, but you know, in reality, my customers are going to go on there and they're going to buy from me. Um, but one thing that I talked about with um, you know the sales rep when we were talking to them a few weeks ago is that their sort of idea is eventually different farms that are on that are using grown by could link with each other. So like if I'm selling products from another grown by farmer, I could like link it to their inventory on their farm. Oh. And so it'd be a way to start to do more integrations between farms. 
Um, so that's definitely down the road. They don't have that feature yet, but he mentioned it as something that they're like thinking about developing. So I found that really interesting because I thought maybe I could I could start to recruit like my friends into Grown By, and then potentially we could like start to network our farms a little bit more by having a shared software. So I like that. That's, that's super interesting. So you can, you can manage your own sales uh, and production off one program and then uh, out of your own store and yep. then have your friend that's still doing his own thing at the same time and cross inventories. That's super cool. I've yeah, never heard that. And people having to go like go to the other farm site. It was like, if you're selling from that farm and, and then they would be able to manage their own inventory on their own, their own site. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's kind of a hybrid of that food, food hub model and the, the individual farm site model that sounds really interesting. i'm gonna check that out actually after this <laughs> that sounds like an interesting program i like that a lot and four to five percent is not that much i think what is square takes but three percent plus like 30 cents so that's right. like, and that's just just for the credit card so that's it sounds like you get, you get quite a bit more value added with with, with grown by yeah yeah no I, I i was when he told me what they charged i went oh it was like a no-brainer it was like of course you know that's that's just that's just cheaper than what i'm doing now yeah, and do you, do they offer any like uh, CSA credit options on there? So can you like preload people's accounts and like give them like you know whatever you know three hundred dollars they spend it down and it's done? Can you yep, still yep, they out? definitely they definitely have that option. Yeah, um, and like so yeah, when we started out, we were fully customizable CSA, and we did that in part to differentiate ourselves from the other farms in the area. We didn't just want to be like another you know CSA standard CSA farm, but gradually we learned that there were people who did just want that standard box. And so we kind of have a two had a two track CSA where you could either sign up for the standard share, you get the farmer's choice, or you could sign up for the customizable share, and you would pay in and then spend that money down. Um, and then you know when 2020 hit and we opened up our online store and that kind of replaced farmers market, we it kind of seemed like our custom share CSA members and our just like online farm stand members were just kind of like it felt kind of redundant like we had two tracks of customers but they were basically doing the same thing, so. Last year, we decided to just get rid of the custom CSA. And it's like, you're either a standard chair member or you're an online farm stand customer. That turned out to be a mistake because we definitely lost sales because the people who had signed up for the custom share, they just kind of, a lot of them just stopped ordering or they ordered way less, way more sporadically because they didn't have that buy-in, you know, that they've spent money and bought into the farm. And so we're going to bring that back next year. But yeah, it will just be basically... You know, I'm not even sure that we'll call it CSA necessarily, but we'll just offer to our online farm stand customers, hey, you can spend in at the beginning of the year, get this amount, and then you and then you spend it down. Like we're really going to push that and encourage that. Um, we may not even say it's a customizable CSA just because we don't want to necessarily confuse people, but we want to say like there's the standard CSA and then there's the online farm stand. But I think that will get a lot of our former CSA customers who were custom share members back on board and buying from the farm again. Yeah, it's interesting to. I, I, I've also felt times like, oh well, yeah, no one really wants the you know preset bots. They'll, they they want full choice, but there is a percentage of the community who just wants a wants a set bots of of product. Yep, yep, yeah. It's interesting. You learn like you learn your customer types, and like there's certain people who are like they want they only want exactly what they want and the exact amount. They don't want like an ounce more than that. And then there's other people who are like, just give me what's in season. Just give me what's <laughs> yeah. good. You know, it's just like people are people are have just tons of different preferences. So, including the preference to not make a choice. You know, yeah. No, I, we have an option at our CSA. So ours is a pick your own. But we have an option. To, we call it the old school CSA. You can yeah. get it. You know, we we'll, we'll choose for you. And it always blows me away how many people week after week after week just want that. I, it it yeah. It, it always it always intrigues me. I'm like, well, are you sure you don't want to choose exactly what you want? Like, no. Just just give me a box of food. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, I was a CSA customer for a year before I started the farm. So I always kind of think back to like, how did I use a CSA? And I think I probably would have fallen more in that category of like, yeah, just give me a box, you know, because it just kind of eliminates some of the choice or, you know, there's kind of, there's the fatigue that comes from making decisions. And so it's like, yeah, just give me, just, you make the, you make the choice and I'll just like figure out what to do with it. So. Yeah, totally. Uh, so let's do a little, little change of pace here. I want to get into production a little bit and how you're managing, managing your, uh, your farm. Uh, so I've seen on Instagram, you're using, uh, some no-till production, some tillage production. Uh, I want to hear what's your mindset about how you manage your fields and your, and your bed flips and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we've been, I would say we've been experimenting with no-till production. Um, we did do a SARE farmer rancher grant, uh, 2020 and 2021, along with another farm, Humble Hands Harvest in Decorah, Iowa. And so we were kind of doing a side-by-side -side comparison of a tillage system and a no-till system. And it's interesting because, you know, I learned a lot from that experiment. Um, I did, 
I really made an earnest attempt to do a lot of no-till and I struggled to maintain the no-till, especially doing the bed flips mid-season. Um, there came a certain point where I needed to prep a ton of beds and the sun was going down and it was going to rain tomorrow. And I just got out the rototiller and rototilled. And so I, I just found for whatever reason with my time management or whatever, I just like, I, I found it hard, especially early in the season, it was easier to, to take the time to actually do the no-till prep. Um, so yeah, so we've, mo I would say this year, we kind of started to transition back into mostly just doing tillage, but um, uh, we did this year, we did like bring a field back into production all no-till. Um, and I still like the idea of using no-till to like, um, especially when the soil is kind of degraded to sort of bring that field back into production. But I think I've started to think a lot more about a tillage rotation. So about being much more thoughtful with how we use tillage and the main thing that got me interested in no-till was um, that uh, we were rototilling for a number of years and we ended up with a hard pan in our soil. And we had a flood in 2018 uh, where we had pretty saturated soil and then we got two, three to four inch rains one night after another. And the soil was completely saturated with like, there was no more pore space for the water to go. And what I saw was the water was just kind of flowing over the surface of the soil. And when I reached my hand down, I could just like feel there was a hard pan layer there and the water couldn't penetrate it, and it was just flowing through the soil. And so I realized I had to do something about that hard pan. And that got me interested in no-till the idea of, you know, not actually creating, recreating that hard pan. But another thing I did was I bought a chisel plow and the chisel plow is just several vertical shanks. It just runs through and shatters that hard pan. And what I found is that if I chisel plow first and then rototill, I don't end up with a hard pan in the same way that I used to when I just rototill. We, we've had kind of a hybrid system for the last several years where we, we manage part of the farm as like a intensive market garden style, you know, 30 to 36 inch beds, hundred foot long, double, usually double cropping, um, compost. That's kind of the main source of fertility, no till or low till bed prep. Um, and then the other section of the farm we manage is more of a conventional, you know, chisel plow, rototill and plastic mulch. To control weeds so and then we've kind of grown certain crops in that intensive system you know more of our greens carrots radishes more high value shorter season crops and then in the what we call the long field which is kind of longer and more oriented for tractor use we grow our longer season lower value crops and so that's kind of been our system for you know the last three or four years um and so we were we were experimenting with the no-till in the market garden setting that section while we were continuing to do our conventional um, tillage in the in the the long fields and so we've kind of transitioned back to using tillage in the in the market garden as well um but yeah we're in flux because i'm actually really trying to get away from plastic mulch um we kind of went all in on plastic mulch because and maybe you can relate but in your early years being bad at weed control having a lot of weed seed fall on, on your soil. And then you're having to deal with the consequences of that as in the years to come. And so I felt like that's where I was at and plastic mulch was really allowing me to like continue growing, you know, uh, while I learned. And so I'm now at a point where I feel more confident about uh, cultivation and we're really going kind of more all in on cultivation next year. So we're still going to use plastic mulch probably on some of our crops where we think it makes the most sense. The weed pressure is the highest or the the solar gain from having black plastic you know makes the most sense um but we are i just uh, purchased a planet junior tractor a walk behind tractor for cultivation and so i'm kind of getting nice. into that world there's a very supportive community around that including some people in iowa um and and then that will allow us to also do cultivation in our intensive garden you know because it's just a walk behind tractor and then i'm also we just purchased a, a ford 8n an old uh old four wheel tractor and I'm going to buy a tine rake um, or a tine weeder. And so that's going to be another approach that we take. So yeah, we're really trying to move more into bare soil cultivation um, and get away from plastic mulch, but yeah, continuing with, um, continuing with, you know, basically using the rototiller. I mean, I'm, I've explored different options like rotary harrows, um, kind of more lower, um, not as invasive as intense forms of tillage but I've mostly hesitated because they tend to be quite expensive and require a lot of horsepower. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now, but the chisel plow was really important for us to, to get over that, that place that we were at where we had that hard pan. It, it's really made a huge difference for us. Yeah. I, I kind of 
kind of seen this uh, growth of like you know, again, these hybrid systems where you have you know intense bed production for a few crops make sense in it, but there are a ton of crops like you said yourself that I don't think really always makes hundred sense in that in that in that system that would much make much much more sense in a in plant junior row system, crop system yeah. with uh, finger weeders on it uh, and finding what's appropriate for each crop. And that time of year, and then where your farm's at at that time, I think is the most important. To not be, you know, not be dogmatic about no till or tillage any time, but it's a hybridity and figure out what works best for you at that time. Yeah, and I should say that we've been no till in the high tunnel since two thousand, basically since I think we wrote it till once in there. Otherwise, we've been no till. So we we do we do have. I mean that, and that's I like the no till system in the high tunnel, and we're going to continue to manage our our high tunnels in that way. I mean, basically, we do our bed flip in that situation is we um, we grow tomatoes in there in the summer. Um, we chop those down, um, pull them out of the tunnel. Uh, we irrigate broad fork and then lay down a heavy compost mulch. And then we rake and tilt that. And then we paper pot in greens in like September, we grow greens through the, um, the winter, and then we will replant greens in the spring. Um, and then put tomatoes in, uh, in the, um, in like April or May, and we'll actually just interplant the tomatoes into our spring greens. So, um, so yeah, basically putting a heavy, heavy compost mulch on once in the fall. Um, and then otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, just doing, just doing hand tillage. So and where, do, where are you getting your compost from? We've sourced from a few different places. We used to get our compost from, and so unfortunately in Iowa, we don't have a good source of high quality compost in Iowa. So I have to get stuff trucked from wisconsin and so wow. pretty much half the cost is trucking you know it'd be like a thousand dollars for a, a 40 ton load and then a thousand dollars for shipping basically wow. so it sucks but um yeah that's kind of the situation we're in so i was getting from cowsmo in wisconsin and i recently got some from purple cow um which i've liked a little bit better it's been a little bit they, the, uh, the the cowsmo is, is manure and like sawdust based and then the um the purple cow, which is funny, their name is purple cow, but they don't have manure in their compost, which I think is just like was a big strategic mistake when they made their name. But they're that's more like leaf litter based. So I've actually liked that compost a little bit more. Have you seen an increase in that compost delivery price with, with, with the cost of diesel going up lately? Yeah, I got let's see, I got one load delivered this spring, and I think I was like stealing myself for the price to be outrageous, but it actually wasn't. It was fine. And and in general, that's what I found actually. I, I keep thinking that the the shipping prices are going to be like uh, just kind of like really high, but, and maybe a little bit of increases, but so far from, at least from my suppliers, it's been, it's been mostly okay. Yeah. That's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So you mentioned earlier doing a little bit of paper pot transplanting. Uh, are, are you mainly using direct seeding transplants? How, uh, what's kind of mid side your property? Yeah, we do a mix of all of them. Um, yeah, we, um, we do a lot of hand transplanting, especially with the plastic mulch for hand transplanting, all of that. Um, yeah, we got the paper pot transplanter in 2019 and we use that primarily for lettuce, spinach, um, beets actually. Um, and we've used it for green onions and we haven't really used it as much for, I think it's great for onions, but because we've been planting onions into plastic mulch, we haven't been able to use it. So yeah, it's primary, it's really been for lettuce, spinach, beets. Um, it's, and it's fantastic. Um, especially for like that bed flip in the high tunnel in the fall where we're able to like transplant that whole tunnel with paper potted greens and get a little bit of a jump, um, over direct seeding. But yeah, we, we do, um, direct seed certain crops, but we tend to, yeah, we tend to transplant our, our greens more. We will direct seed, um, spinach and lettuce mix, um, and then carrots obviously, and radishes and turnips, um, things like that. Uh, we did just use an earthway for a really long time and just got, got away with that. I used to plant pelleted carrot seed with an earthway with the beet plate. And it would just dump the seed down and <laughs> it, it just, we just went with it. And then I got a Jang and started using a Jang and I was like, Oh, okay. I get it now. <laughs> it actually like puts the seed out in a, in, in a, you know, regular, uh, uniform yeah. way. So, so I've really liked having the, having a Jang cedar, um, for, for, especially for, yeah, for carrots and, um, yeah, the carrots are, are a fairly big, fairly big crop for us. Um, we try to grow them throughout the year and also grow them as a, as a storage crop. So that's kind of, 
I'd say the main thing that we direct seed, but we do direct seed some other stuff too. Yeah, I just got my first Jane I think last season. I had used Earth Earthquake almost seven years. By the time I got a Jane, I'm like, oh my word, what have I been doing forever? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, I was always like, oh, it's too complicated. I won't. It's like yeah. it's not that complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. No, I felt the same way. It's not like the Earthway just you know hit one little bump and just goes flying. Yeah, or it's it, so light. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, I love the I love the heaviness. I mean, that's what I've said about other people is like the Jang is so heavy. It's and it's actually better. In, I mean, in the no till situations, I think it's a much better cedar for no till. Um, and that's you know one of the challenges we've had with the paper pot is initially we were basically always using that in a no till situation, and so it just took a lot of extra raking because you can't have any clods at all in the bed if you're using a paper pot, because it will just clog up the chain and the paddles. And so as we've gone a little bit more towards tilling again, it's kind of like, oh yeah, this, this system was meant to be used in a rototilled soil. It just is quite a bit, quite a bit easier to run the the paper pot, but we did use it in, in no-till and, and we're able to make it work. So, yeah, I've seen a few farms who were, you know, they're in pretty deep compost mulch systems using the, uh, uh, the planter. And uh, I, I'm not saying every single time, but I, I've talked to them and said, you know, after we pull the chain down, we have to go after, back afterwards and then like, push it back in and kind of push it around in there. I'm like, well, at that point, I'm not <laughs> saying you re- you kind of just, re- you know, kind of erased the labor you've saved by e- the paper pot. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, you're still I, definitely I think has you're, to be a you're not spot. too far off there. Yeah. It definitely has to be a certain amount of tilth, whether that be super clean organic, super clean, deep compost mulch, or freshly tilled soil. Definitely your soil has to be right to make those those systems work. When earlier you're talking about uh, kind of the high wind situation and kind of moving towards uh, uh, high tunnel production instead of cat tunnels, uh, do you have any brand of tunnels that you're that you're growing that you're using, you're growing in that you found have been resistant or to stand up to the high winds you're you're getting out there? Yeah, we um we source a lot of our stuff through Nults, which is in um there's one in Charles City, Iowa. There's also one in Pennsylvania. Um, I think they're it's like the same family. Um, and so they get Zimmerman tunnel, tunnels out of Missouri. So you can I mean we get them through Nults, but like it's Zimmerman tunnels in Missouri. Um, and so we've got the Gothic style 96 by 30 tunnel. They're very well built tunnels. I, I think they're great. Um, the instructions were extremely spare. So I'm glad that I had already built a greenhouse before. Um, our first greenhouse was from um, Farm Tech, which is also based in Iowa. But I wouldn't recommend those. They're they're underbuilt. They're quite. They're not very well designed. And actually, one of uh, someone who was on the property here had a carpentry shop. Kind of saw the greenhouse after I built it. And he went in and put a bunch of wire in between all of the um, the supports to kind of tighten things up because he saw how much sway there was between the. Um, between the supports. So it's, it's fine. The greenhouse is, is standing, but yeah, I've, I've liked the ones I've sourced through, um, through Nults and I, I would definitely would get our, our next one through there. Um, yeah, we, um, we pour all of the footings in concrete, every single one, um, which I think is important in our kind of high wind situation. We use the polycarbonate end walls rather than like the, the fabric ones or even wood ones. Um, and, uh, the other thing, um, this has, doesn't have anything to do with wind, but we, we just tried to level the land ourselves last time with like a tractor and a, and a blade and just didn't do a very good job. So next time we're going to actually hire someone to like level the land. I think that's a, that's an important, important thing to hire out on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I've seen people use, like use it, what's it called? Uh, laser levels and all those like high tech things get it just right. Yeah. I like when I do the same, just trying like, well, yeah, we're on a line and a water level, but it's never as accurate. Yeah. As, as as done professionally. So besides the uh, hoop house uh, us on the property, do you have uh, is a wa- you have a wash pack? I'm assuming yep. uh, on, on size well. Uh, what, what's your cold storage like to handle all those winter crops? Yeah, so we have a we have a 14 by nine walk in cooler that's um, run by a cool bot. So we have like a 24,000 BTU whole house air conditioner run off a of cool bot, and it's a super insulated room. So I had someone build it for us, and it's it's spray foam like joist to joist. So it's like two times the amount of spray foam we normally <laughs> ap- apply. So it's super insulated room. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's our main cooler. So it's, it's, it's great size for us. We can, we can really load. I mean, we've last year, we kind of almost maxed it out for root crops. We definitely could do more to max, max it out for, for root crops um, in the future. But yeah, that's our main cold storage. We have a sort of, we use a, a building that was built on the property actually as a tofu production facility. Uh, so my, my landlord um, family, briefly ran a tofu production facility <laughs> on their farm where they processed their own organic soybeans into tofu. 
um, which they only did for like a year or two. And then they were bought out by a bigger company and the production moved elsewhere. But that's <laughs> the building I'm in now. I'm in, that's where my office is. Um, and so I kind of repurposed the loading dock area into my wash pack area. And so it's, it's a heated area. It has my cooler. It has a three bottom sink, um, has like, you know, our scales and stuff. And then in 2021, um, we built a, like an extension onto that. So like kind of off of the loading dock door, like a, a, you know, 25 by 50 foot extension. That's, uh, you know, kind of an unheated three season wash area. So that's now where we do like our washing and our crate cleaning and that kind of stuff. So we kind of have like a dirty wet area and then we have like a cleaner indoor heated area. And so that, that's been a great, cause we used to just do everything in the same space and it just wasn't, there just wasn't enough, wasn't enough space. So that's, that's been a big, big improvement. That conditioned heat space is so valuable, especially when you start getting towards those end of the year months. Yes. Uh, no one wants to put dunk in your hands in cold water outside in a hoop house when unheated. Is, it gets real old real fast. Yeah, yeah. And and it's like even with this three season one, I'm kind of pushing it because like it's got about a 10 degree buffer between the outdoor temperature and what it is inside. So when we start to get like 20 degrees and colder, I have to drain all the lines in there. So I'm kind of it's this this time of year is a little bit difficult because I'm kind of doing that dance of like it's like is it it's too cold in there in the morning to work or I'm heating it a little bit. So I think eventually it would probably make sense to like insulate and heat this as we move more into winter production. But, um, but I do have that indoor space that I can use. So like even during the deep winter, I can like do washing and packing and stuff in that indoor space. So, Oh, that's fantastic. So we're kind of shift a little bit, uh, kind of made your financial goals for your farm. So in the next few years, where do you see yourself heading? What are your kind of your long-term plans for Middleway Farm financially or just growth in general? Yeah. Well, we, we made a big jump, you know, from 2019 to 2020, we had a big jump in sales. Um, like a lot of people did our CSA grew, our online sales grew, our wholesale has grown. So we kind of jumped from, you know, grossing around 60 to $75,000 a year to grossing a hundred thousand plus dollars per year. And then we also just, there's been a lot of grant money floating around the last few years. So we've also been, we've also benefited from quite a, quite a bit of grant money through COVID stimulus and local ag, um, uh, the Iowa department of, um, of ag. So that's been really great for allowing us to make some like investments, like the wash house and some equipment. Um, but, you know, personally, I've been dissatisfied with the amount of money I've been making from the farm. I mean, I basically have been making about 15 to $20,000 a year, um, uh, most years. And especially for the amount of time that I put into the farm. And I think the skills that I have, um, when I just talk to other people about their jobs and like, they're dissatisfied with like $45,000 a year. I'm like, that's a dream. <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, you know, and I've been working with a business coach this year and it's actually been really good because it's, it's gotten me a little bit out of the rut of just kind of being like, oh, I'm stuck at this level. I, I kind of can't level up. And I started to, to kind of take a few more risks in terms of like, I bought a nice delivery vehicle and got a loan for it. Um, I've been investing in equipment. I've been a little bit more aggressive about like, I'm going to invest in some equipment. We're going to expand a little bit more. Um, and I'm feeling a little bit more confident about moving into the wholesale market and um, I really would like to move towards having more permanent employees. I think it's probably the biggest labor is the biggest wild card for me year to year. And with all my employees being seasonal and part-time, I've been lucky to have people come back. You know, some people have come back year to year, but in a lot of cases, there's just a ton of turnover. So one thing I've really been thinking about is trying to, you know, hire some people at a decent wage, you know, $15 an hour is a floor. Um, have them be like 10 month employees, you know, so that they would be laid off for a certain time during the winter, but basically would, you know, they'd be making enough money that with maybe a second job, you know, during the winter time, they'd be able to get by, especially in a place like Grinnell where cost of living is relatively cheap. Um, with the hope that I could retain people from year to year, that's kind of the goal is to have some like a solid core of people, you know, maybe two other people that I could retain year to year. And we could really start to build a culture on the farm of like, uh, delegating different tasks of them being able to contribute to the farm to help me innovate, to help me like, you know, take care of bottlenecks and sort of think through things. Um, and then continuing to hire a seasonal, seasonal crew um, during the summer. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking to kind of, we're looking to kind of push our sales up, um, you know, hopefully above that, like $150,000 a year mark. Uh, I'm hoping to, you know, start to make more money, 25, 30, 30, $35,000 a year would be my goal, which would be an actual sustainable amount of money for me. Uh, my wife works off farm. She has a pretty good job. Um, we've never been in, you know, we live in a shared household with three income earning adults. So it's never, I've never had a lot of pressure to make a lot of money. I've always made enough money to to kind of cover my basic expenses, but 
I'm in my thirties now. We have a child. It's kind of like I'm I'm wanting to I'm wanting more compensation for for what I'm doing, and I'm kind of starting to learn what it's going to take to do that. Um, you know, so it's a combination of increasing our sales and you know trying to reduce or hold our expenses down. Um, which I think you know I would say my as a farmer, what I've noticed about me from a business perspective, I'm pretty good at selling stuff. You know, like I'm pretty good at actually like selling like you know quite a bit of you know um, food given the space that we grow on. But uh, I'm not good at holding expenses down. Like, and so that's kind of something I'm trying to figure out how to navigate of like, yes, we need to increase our sales, but also we need to kind of like try to hold our expenses down as well. Um, so I'm saying that at the same time that we're putting a bunch of money into equipment and stuff. But part of that <laughs> is labor savings because that's one of our biggest things the last few years is we've just found our biggest single expense is labor. And I feel like we haven't been able, we haven't had very efficient use of labor. And part of that is because we have, um, you know, that's kind of seasonal part-time worker who requires a lot of training and, and isn't very fast and they don't really stay on the farm long enough to really get good at things. And so I'm hoping if we can pay a little bit, shell a little bit more on labor, but get a lot more out of the people that we, we hire by having them be more long-term committed people. So that, that's, that's kind of the current vision right now is we are, we are trying to make a push to, this was my 10th year growing and kind of, kind of felt like it was a put up or shut up kind of year. Like, like I need yeah. to stop being so timid about, about taking some risks and really believing in myself that yes, I'm capable of producing on a larger scale. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, especially with the, uh, I'd say this business coaching has been, it's just helped me kind of psychologically more than anything, just kind of get over some of my fear of my fears of failure of, of not not really fully believing in myself. Well, congrats on that ten years. That's a huge. It's a huge accomplishment, and also hitting six figures gross. That's a that's a big accomplishment. Yeah, no, I definitely. That's, when we hit that figure, I, that's when I really started feeling a bit like a farmer. It was like, oh, I like yeah. that. Really, kind of gave me a lot of confidence. Is like when COVID hit and our sales jumped, we really jumped in that other category. That was like, you know, I think I maybe I was I was listening to the interview you did with Jesse, like the intro interview, and. Yeah. Uh, um, mentioned like what, what, like, at what point did you start to feel like a real farmer? You know, that was what, that's when I really was like, yes, like I'm like, we're grossing over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Like we're really producing a lot of food. Like we're like, we're serious now. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And part of me feels like once you get past that tenure, once you start getting towards that, we're in the same boat too, once you get towards around 10 years or so that like you've gotten past, you've gotten past like the rough seas effect of farming. Like, okay, you know, what? I'm stable. I understand my business a little bit. I understand my, my, my consumers and, and maybe on some level, like, I've recovered from like the woes of the first 10 years. And now I'm ready for that. And that's big. And that's a big jump in production. Uh, that sounds like you're on a great path uh, to, 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 to do that. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So last two questions. Um, what has been uh, kind of an open platform for you? What's been on your heart lately as a farmer? Is there any topics in ag that's been weighing on you? You know, what's uh, what's going on in your head? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think a lot about sort of the big issues of, of agriculture and political economy and um, you know, and just like the, the, the direction of our society or how we should organize our society and how farming fits into that. And, you know, there was a recent survey that the national young farmer coalition did. And they said the number one issue for being beginning farmers was land access. And it's so obvious when you look at land values, especially in Iowa in, in uh, Sioux County, Iowa, which is uh, Northwestern Iowa, there's some farmland that just sold for $30,000 an acre. Um, <laughs> My word. and like the average price for farmland in most of Iowa is maybe 10,000. And like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was 5,000. So the value of land is just skyrocketed. Um, and so it's just, it's rapidly becoming inaccessible. And it's also meaning it's just concentrating more and more. The people who do own land are just getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And it's concentrating yeah. wealth in fewer and fewer hands. Um, and so like in other countries, when people are not able to access land, um, like the, they say, we need land reform, or we need land redistribution. And I kind of think that that's what we need to start talking about or what we need to start thinking about is not just land access, but land reform, land redistribution, um, because land ownership is, is way, way too highly concentrated in this country. Um, and I think what we're seeing with this, this skyrocketing land values is just a natural consequence of what happens when you commodify land. Um, and so we need to start thinking about how do we, de how do we decommodify land? How do we start to get land into the hands of people who've been, uh, excluded from land ownership? Um, how do we start to make repair for the way that people have been excluded from land ownership? Um, so yeah. And, and, you know, in other countries, when you see that call for land reform, it's a mass movement, you know, it's not just, oh, we're lobbying Congress. It's like, you have to actually build a constituency for that. So I, I would really love to see that start to happen. Um, because I just think there's, there's really no way out of this mess of just, 
you know, fewer and fewer people farming, fewer people having access to land, unless we really start to drain some of that value out and, and, and just decommodify land. So, no, I totally agree. I think there's this false idea that rugged entrepreneurialism and cutthroat capitalism will allow us as farmers to, let's say, rebuild a local food movement. Yeah, but yeah. it's not going to happen. Uh, it's with the cost of land, you know, the, even a down payment to get one acre of land, most people can't save that, up, that much up not even including the cost to develop it. So yeah, definitely the only way we're going to see a real growth, I think, of ag at a little level is uh, yeah, some t- land back movement. Uh, I was Absolutely. talking to a, uh, I was talking to a grower recently and they were like, in our county, yes, we've added 40 new direct consumer farms, you know, this year. And they were all petting pet on the back. I was like, well, but we lost three 400 acre farms and added five 20 acre farms. Or, right. sorry, we had five yeah. two acre farms, yeah. right? And that math doesn't add up. You know, that the long term, we, we're losing all these institutions and all this, all this soil to development in the long term. We're not going to we're not going to feed the world or not going to feed our communities on, you know, one acre farms, just, just a few of them from people who can afford, you know, thirty thousand dollars an acre. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, and in Iowa, you've just seen that you just lost all the medium, all the medium sized farms are the ones that are, are going, you know, so it's like you yeah. see a, a growth in the really small farms, the hobby farms. And you see a growth in the really large farms and it's all the medium sized farms, which are the farms that are like at a scale of production where they're actually producing quite a bit of food and they're producing a livelihood for people, but they're not so big that they actually can have better practices, you know, and they yeah. actually tend to be usually within a family or within a more tightly controlled group of people. Those are the ones that are, that we're losing. And those are the absolute, the ones that you need to feed communities. You know, those are the ones that actually, because the large farms aren't feeding communities, they're exporting commodity crops and the small farms aren't feeding communities because they're just not producing at scale. So yeah, yeah, definitely. We need yeah affordable land and more people on the fi- more people in the fields made it work. Uh, last question: uh, How do you find balance in working on the farm and taking care of yourself, especially as a farmer? You know, we work so many hours just to make things work. How do you take care of yourself day to day? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I'm not always the best at it. I think um, I think the seasonality is really important in terms of being able to get some rest during the winter, having a different schedule. I think having a having a child, which my son Oscar is um, turning four in January, was a huge part of just kind of slowing me down and bringing more balance into my life because it meant that I, I couldn't be away as much. I needed to be home in the evenings and weekends. So he's brought a lot of balance to my life and that I need to be present for him. Um, and so just, you know, being, being responsible for childcare, I think is actually really kind of forced me to be more balanced now. I'm thinking about my work, working fewer hours, hiring more help. Um, has been important, kind of taking some of the physical burden off of me with farming. Um, and then just like having him as part of the farm too, you know, because especially, um, you know, kind of farming as a single person, not as a kind of family farm or a couple. The farm was always kind of like my job. And then I had my home life. And he kind of bridges that a little bit and that he, I kind of like bringing him to the farm and, and having him be a part of it. And I really hope as he grows that he, that he likes, he likes being on the farm and that he wants to, wants to help. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely have, I definitely could do better, especially with, I mean, um, as I've gotten older, the physicality of farming has gotten more difficult and taking care of my body is difficult. Having some sort of exercise outside of farming um, is really important because we think, oh, we're out there all day, you know, working and walking, like we don't need exercise. But uh, I've I've found a lot of value in physical therapy and and um, really trying to take care of, of my body better um, so that I I have the ability to do this long term. And I think hiring more labor is also part of that in terms of, you know, not, not trying, I, I can't imagine being 50 years old and trying to do everything that I was doing when I was 24. So it's kind of like you keep hiring young people because they have, the, yeah. they have the ability to, to stick with it. So, um, but yeah, and I think having that separation where I don't live on the farm has been, is helpful for me and kind of maintaining some, some level of balance. You know, I think, I feel like I work a lot, but I talk to friends and I realize that among farmers, I'm probably not, I'm probably somewhere in the middle or even at the lower end of, of just hours worked, um, which I feel, I feel good about, you know, sometimes it means having to let things slide, you know, not being able to do everything or not being able to get every crop out of the field or, you know, and that's hard sometimes it's like, you know, there were times when, especially when I was younger, where I just worked until it was done. And now as I get older, I just, there's a certain point where I just go, I'm done. I, you know, I'm done for the day. It doesn't matter if I didn't finish it. This is, this is as much as I'm capable of. So those binders are so important to be able to say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I need to just go home, be with my family and just recover. 
yeah, I can't push through anymore. I think when I was younger, I was more willing to just push through and and I just, I, I have just harder boundaries now. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for sharing your words with us, your thoughts, and uh, a little bit about Middle Way Farm. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time on your day. Yeah, thanks so much, Alex. It was fun to talk and I'm excited that you're a host of the podcast now. I'm looking forward to hearing you talk to other farmers. A big thanks to Jordan for taking the time out of his day to share all the work he's doing over there in Iowa. There is such a need in the local food system for logistic professionals and businesses that work to connect farmers with their customers. You can't do it all on the farm. And it's great to see folks like Jordan working with other local food folks in his community to streamline distribution and decrease waste. If you want to learn more about his operation, check out his website and socials. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, have a great day. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here, just jumping in real quick to catch you up on some of what we have going on. The next conference, since it's conference season, I will be taking part in, will be the Organic Association of Kentucky Conference, also known as OAK, in late January, the 26th through the 28th of January, to be precise. Um, Come say hi. That should be a lot of fun. It's not far from here. It's in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, Tickets are on sale now, obviously, and we, No-Till Growers, will have a booth there. Uh, Have you checked out the new No-Till Growers Forum yet? We're up over like 850 members or something and growing like fast. Would love to have you join us uh, to chat about everything from soil management to farm business strategies, talk tools or sell tools, uh, post classifieds for job or land opportunities, um, whatever you want. You can find the forum at notillgrowers.com. We will also put a link in the show notes. Also, like everything that we do, the forum is free and open to the public. If you'd like to support our work, you can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or one of the no-till hats, which are back in stock. The proceeds from those sales at notillgrowers.com go to making you more content. Or lastly, you can always become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, where not only may you get discounts on our stuff, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to these amazing folks, Sean at All About the Garden, Dan Glover, Bill Altman, Ian at Grindstone Farms, Stephen Smith in Ojai Roots. Thank you to everyone who supports our show in whatever way that you can. And that's it for me, y'all. Thanks. We'll see you next week.